will definitely turn it into something. It will be on next Thursday, so exactly in one week yeah. time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. We are going to be uh, Human Rights Watch. At least will be tagged. I don't know if you are on social media. I'm on Twitter for old men. Okay. Twitter? It's not even <laughs> called Twitter anymore. <laughs> <laughs> old men. The fact you call the Twitter, yeah. Twitter.com. <laughs> it provides that. It's Twitter.com. Yeah, proves that you are old. Focus Media Labs about the so-called refugee crisis and issues related to human movement. We are at episode 13, a very important uh, episode for us. And with me, as always, my co-host Rashid Galim. Thank you Welcome so much. Rashid. Welcome, everyone. Uh, and in the studio, we have a very, very significant guest for this topic that we're going to speak about. Bill Van Esfeld is an Associated Director at Human Rights Watch. Welcome, Bill. Thank you very much. In the early morning hours of June 14, 2013, a very, very overcrowded fishing um, vessel called Adriana capsized uh, at the around Pylos, um, which is a city south of Greece, causing around 600 deaths. It had started its journey from Libya five days earlier with an estimated 750 people, uh, mostly asylum seekers and migrants, including little children. Most of the people were from Syria, Pakistan, and Egypt. Only 104 people of those estimated 750 survived. 82 bodies were recovered. And when we record this podcast in March 2024, there are several trials happening simultaneously regarding this issue. And today we will speak to Bill to help us understand what actually happened because Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International conducted interviews with the ones who survived, with people uh, who are relatives of the victims, but also with some members of the Coast Guard. So Bill, let's, let's try to start um, with the simplest thing that we can. What actually happened on this June 14th, 2023, from what you're getting from the, the people who survived? In the early hours of that morning, um, the boat, the Adriana, this fishing trawler that left from Libya four days, uh, five days prior, uh, capsized. And what the witnesses uh, we spoke to all very consistently, every single one of them told us, was that they either saw or directly or that they felt, because they were on this boat, a huge acceleration, a towing. Their own engine had not been working for hours and hours and hours, and suddenly this, this old decrepit boat that people had been dying on, where the engine hadn't been working consistently ever since they left Libya, suddenly it takes off at great speed, and within a very short time after that, it capsizes. And what the witnesses who actually saw what happened said was that this acceleration and capsizing was caused by the Hellenic Coast Guard. They had towed a rope to the front of the vessel, uh, sped off and then changed direction suddenly, and that caused the boat to, to capsize. We have so many concerns, not just about that incident, but about everything that led up to it and everything that has happened since. I mean, this has been obviously a disaster for the lost, mm -hmm. the families of the lost, but also the survivors have, I think, so far had no sense of justice, and they have had no sense that their stories have really been heard by the officials that matter. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bill, let's say <coughs> let's say you are uh, a lawyer in this case, going after the Greek Coast Guard. 
and what evidence could you use in this case? What strong evidence? Um, speaking of Greek lawyers, I should say it wasn't just Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International who were investigating and working on this case. The Greek Council uh, for Refugees has actually represented, along with other Greek uh, lawyers, uh, about 40 survivors who filed a lawsuit in the naval court um, in, in Greece to demand an actual investigation of what, of what happened here. Um, because their feeling was that mm -hmm. the investigations ongoing have been uh, too slow and, and, and insufficient. But what kind of evidence is there? Well, we've got a bunch of stuff. Um, the biggest, you know, uh, start to the clock, I guess you could say, uh, for when a rescue operation should definitely have happened in Greek waters was at about 11 a.m. the day before. So this would be June 13th, 2023. Um, at 11 a.m., the um, Italian search and rescue center and Frontex uh, see, this, see this ship in Greek waters and they alert the Greek authorities. How did they see it? They saw it through a combination of assets. Uh, Frontex has a bunch of aerial assets. Uh, there was a drone mm -hmm. that repeatedly saw this, um, this stricken vessel, which was clearly overcrowded. By that point, there were already at least two dead bodies on board. And some survivors told us, who, s survivors who were on the top deck, like the, the roof of the, of, the, of the boat, they said they had purposefully displayed one of those bodies on the top of the Adriana so that passersby could see how much distress they were in. They were desperate to be, to be rescued. Um, so we've got these, this type of evidence, right? The clock starts ticking, and that's very important because it's 15 hours later that the capsizing finally happens. So it's not just the concern who caused the ship to sink, but why didn't anybody rescue them in the meantime? Even if it hadn't been capsized, people were already dying, people were you know, dehydrated, there were little kids on board, people were terribly sick. You couldn't be in more distress than this. The, the engine wasn't working, it was overcrowded, there were dead on board. It should have been rescued and there were 15 hours in which to do so. so it's a piece of evidence. Mm -hmm. um, whenever you get, there was also later a Greek uh, helicopter that spotted the spotted the boat. There were two commercial vessels, two big tankers that were called in by the Greek authorities after they finally sort of were seized of the matter um, to come and take a look, in a mm -hmm. sense, and you know to deliver some food and water. They were throwing water bottles from the decks of these gigantic tankers onto the much lower deck of the Adriana. Again, those uh, ship's captains, one of them said in the record that he could see the, the, the Adriana was clearly in distress. People were cr crying out for rescue. So that's also part of the evidentiary body, right? What, those, what that helicopter saw and what those two captains and other people on board those commercial vessels saw. And some of them took pictures, mm -hmm. which have been published in the media. Speaking of pictures, a lot of the people on the Adriana, the, the migrants, they also had cameras. And several of those witnesses we spoke to said their cameras were still working and they were videoing and taking pictures throughout the entire journey, including and up until the moment of capsizing. Mm -hmm. And some of them actually said they had their, their phones in waterproof mm -hmm. containers, right? So even when the ship capsized, they still had those phones on them until the moment they were rescued, finally. And then the phones were taken off of them. They were told by the Greek Coast Guard, you need to give these to us. You'll get them back, don't worry. It's for safekeeping. But there was never any even attempt to record the name of the person who gave over this phone, the name of the person who gave over that phone. And those people didn't see their phones again until I believe s the uh, lawyers representing them eventually got like a bag of about 20 phones mm -hmm. that the Coast Guard later said they found somewhere on their ship. Mm -hmm. Right? All together? Yeah. That's a lie. So that's a concern, right? There's evidence that probably went missing that certainly hasn't been considered by any investigation that was on the survivor's phones. Okay, that's mm -hmm. another piece of evidence. But there's other stuff that is missing or that is very weird, and it really m raises questions about the value of the investigations that have been going on so far. Mm -hmm. One example would be the witness statements, the survivor statements that were taken immediately upon arrival on land by the Greek Coast Guard, right? They talked to some of the people who survived. What happened? What happened? Give us your statement. Very strange things about those statements, which um, another group called Lighthouse Reports first, I think, documented. They used the same words, the exact same words, to describe what happened, mm -hmm. even though these are different witnesses being interviewed in different languages by different interpreters. Somehow what comes out uses the exact same phrases 
and none of them mention that they were towed and that's why they were capsized because they were pulled along by a rope. What according to these first statements you hear is, well, the boat capsized because it was old and a lot of people drowned because there weren't enough life jackets. No mention of the thing that everybody then said actually happened, which was that it was towed by the ship, uh, the, the, the Greek uh, Coast Guard, which caused it to, to capsize. So clearly these people were either afraid to tell the truth or that detail about how all of the translations use mm -hmm. the exact same language, you know, raises concerns that this is not really what these people said, you know, that it was doctored, that it was mm -hmm. what um, the Greek Coast Guard wanted to hear. And unfortunately, there is precedent for that. In 2014, another ship off the coast of the small island of Pharmakonisi was also towed and capsized by the Greek Coast Guard. And we know this because that court has gone, that case has gone all the way up to the European Court of Human Rights, which found that witness statements, again, were you know, tampered with, were not, were not authentic, it's not really what the witnesses said. And in that case, 11 people died um, out of, uh, on, on that ship in 2014. So there's very concerning parallels about tampering with evidence mm -hmm. in, in a similar case that already happened about, about 10 years prior. Mm -hmm. um, Bill, can I, uh, uh, can I organize our knowledge here? So, the day prior, uh, the boat uh, capsized. We already know that uh, the Italian Coast Guard sees uh, this uh, fishing boat, uh, that there's Frontex involved. Uh, there are those two commercial um, ships. Were those commercial ship, uh, ships not able or in a position to rescue people? Uh, you mentioned that they were throwing water um, to, the, to the ship. Could they do something more? Were they in uh, some kind of a contact with, uh, for example, Italian Coast Guard? Those two ships were called by the Greek authorities. Uh, those two commercial ships mm -hmm. were called by the Greek authorities. And, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk to the captains of those ships. They didn't really want to talk to our investigation. Um, but we, from what they said and from what survivors told us, they were real close. They were, like, almost touching um, the, the Adriana. They were right there, and people were screaming at them, rescue us, you know. Mm -hmm. We don't want food and water. We're going to die. You need to get us off the ship. And, and those pleas for help were not listened to. Now, why that happened, I don't know. Maybe the um, commercial vessels were, we know they were called by the Greek authorities. Maybe they were given instructions, just provide some water and food and don't do anything else. You know, I, that I'm speculating now why they didn't rescue, but they had mm -hmm. a duty mm -hmm. to rescue. If you have capacity to rescue and you see a ship in distress at sea, it's your obligation. Now, this is primarily, we think, on the Greek authorities, that obligation to rescue. But anybody involved, you know, could have done more, or we wouldn't see more than 600 dead people. But how they were called, but after the sinking? So no, sorry, before. So uh, let me give you a quick yeah, yeah. timeline. All right, so 11 a.m. on June 13th, mm -hmm. right, is the first sighting of this ship in distress, the Adriana. By the Italians. By the Italians and Frontex, mm -hmm. right? Then later on, about 3.30 in the afternoon, now there's, there's other things going on, mm -hmm. like the Frontex drone passes overhead, the Greek um, helicopter passes overhead, and then you've got the call from the Greek authorities to these two commercial vessels to come uh, take a look and, and help out to some extent. At around 3.30, the Greek uh, search and rescue um, authorities dispatch a patrol boat, and it's in Crete, Right, so this shipwreck is happening off the Peloponnese, right, off of this uh, town of, of Pylos. There are other naval assets and Coast Guard assets that are closer to it, right? But instead, the ship that is dispatched to take a look, the, of the first official ship in the water sent by, by Greece itself mm -hmm. is in Crete, and it takes about seven hours what? to get there. Mm -hmm. So that's another question. Why did they send a ship that was so far away to go and do this. And why did they send this ship? This ship that they sent was a patrol, I'm saying ship, I shouldn't be, it, it was a patrol boat, mm -hmm. right? It had only 43 life jackets on board. It was not a search and rescue ship. Greece has search and rescue ships. Why didn't they send one of those, right? Anyway, um, this, is, this is another aspect of concern, and I don't want to jump around too much, but we've got concerns about what happened during those 15 hours when that boat in distress was in Greek waters. Um, no rescues happening. And then we've got concerns about how it got sunk and capsized, according to all the survivors, by this, naval, by this Coast Guard patrol boat that was sent from Crete. That's the one that 
tied the rope to the front of it and tried to tow it towards Italian waters, I should have said. This is the entire motive for what was going on as we kind of reconstruct it was that the Greek authorities didn't want these, this big boat of migrants in its, t in its mm -hmm. sea. It wanted to get rid of this problem and say, go to Italy. And what the survivors told us is that that was the communication between that Coast Guard patrol boat and the people on this, the, the trawler that sank was that we're going to tow you to Italian waters. It's, it's not too far away. Don't worry that your engine isn't working. That's where you're going to go. And then it sinks. Then we have concerns about what happened after that, why more people weren't rescued, even given that this patrol boat wasn't fully equipped for search and rescue. It still took a very long time to send out small rubber boats that could have rescued people who were mm -hmm. in the water. When the boat capsized, when the Adriana, the fishing trawler, capsized, people climbed onto the hull of the boat. It was completely upside down, so the part that's usually under the water was flipped over above the water. People say, you know, some of our survivors, they, they told us themselves they had climbed up there and they saw, you know, scores to hundreds of people who had climbed up on that boat, uh, that upturned ship, and then it sank. Over the course of minutes, or maybe half an hour, you know, your sense of time in that kind of, you know, it's the middle of the night, you're panicked, it's, it's terrifying circumstances, your sense of time may not be exact, but, you know, it took at least half an hour, some time, before anybody started getting rescued. Why did that amount of time elapse as well? So it's from the beginning to the end of this thing that we've got concerns about what happened at sea. People should have rescued before it capsized, it shouldn't have been towed, it should have been rescued, um, and then when it did capsize, there should have been an urgent, you know, emergency saving of as many people as, as could be. Instead, the survivor said, the lights of the Coast Guard patrol boat went far away, well. and then later on came back and sent some rubber boats. But the first reaction was to leave the site of the emergency rather than to get closer and start saving people. Uh, I don't know if you can confirm this uh, to me, but there are many women and children that died uh, during this shipwreck. And is this because so many of them were under deck uh, and uh, men predominantly stayed on top, therefore had more chances of surviving? Yeah, whether you lived or died depended on where you were sitting. So it's exactly as you say, the people who were on the very top included some boys who I was able to, who we were able to speak to, the only eight children, only eight children survived. Um, and it's because of where they were sitting. They were all on that top deck. So when the, the boat capsized, some people, were act some people were thrown into the water. Other people were sort of hanging on to parts of the ship that suddenly went way up in the air. And then they began to fall down, slide down the deck. Um, you know, uh, just awful. But the people who were on the inside of the ship uh, many um, Pakistani people, from what we were told, as well as women and children, they had no, no chance to get out. Mm -hmm. It was just suddenly the floor became the ceiling and everything was underwater and, and there was no way out. Whoa. Uh, how is it legal that they, like they tow it to Italy? What do they do with this constantly? When there is a ship, they take it to Italy. Are there any uh, international waters, by the way, between uh, like this in this part of Mediterranean? I'm not sure if it would have passed through international waters between the. I mean, the uh, but the apart from the question of whose territorial waters is it? I mean, that's sort of one legally question. Mm -hmm. Another one is whose search and rescue zone is it in? So I think the key thing to remember here is that this whole time there's no question whose search and rescue area this boat was in, and it was in it was in Greece's. Mm -hmm. Um, what this goes to is just sort of the narrative that the, the Greek authorities began saying immediately following news of the shipwreck coming out, which was first a claim that it never actually stopped and needed rescue. This overcrowded, stricken vessel where all the survivors told us the engine had been conking out, you know, not just the day before, but even, bef even previously. But then the engine wasn't really working at all. They were stuck in the water. The captain was lost. They didn't know what was going on. Um, the Greek version was that, the official version was that, no, 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 that ship never really stopped. Um, it was motoring ahead for Italy, which is why we didn't have to rescue it. We never, you know, it wasn't in distress. The, the engine was working. Um, 
That is not true. Um, uh, it's not just what the survivors told us, but the BBC did a pretty clever reenactment, or not reenactment, but the reconstruction of what happened. There's a, um, there's a commercial marine uh, ship tracking app that you can get. And you could just see where all of the commercial ships in that whole area of the Mediterranean were throughout the entire course of this day of disaster. And you could see that as soon as the Adriana, at the same time that the Adriana went down, tons of ships go to the spot where it went down. And you can see that that spot where these ships had been circling around never changed over the course of hours and hours and hours. So the, the claim that this, this fishing vessel was just motoring along happily and the engine was working and it was just constantly going towards Italy and never stopped and needed assistance is, is false. It had stopped for hours and we can tell that even through commercial ship tracking data in addition to what the survivors told us. Can you explain to me something? So Solomon uh, article mentions like the PPLS 920, the Coast Guard vessel, one of the four state-of-art vessels purchased for 55 million euros. It's one of the best equipped vessels available in Greece and it could not be in better hands. In March 2023, its captain was awarded for his valuable contribution to the protection of maritime borders and human life at sea. Yet cameras were off, people died. Like how come this yeah. technology and everything? The cameras were off, right? So yeah, let's yeah. let's talk about some more cameras, right? First, you've got all of the cameras in people's smartphones who were the survivors, right? Those get confiscated, and it's not like I'm going to give you a little receipt for your phone mm. so that you can get it back someday. No, no, they just take it. You have to give those to us. Then there's the fact that the uh, vessel, this patrol boat, mm -hmm. as you say, state-of-the-art, multi-million dollar vessel, amazingly none of its cam and we know it had cameras, right? There's been previous images published from that ship's cameras. Um, you know, a terrible luck. All the cameras yeah. were off, right? Then you've got what about the um, people, the personnel, mm -hmm. the Coast Guard um, officials who were on that ship? They had phones. Well, uh, there is supposedly an inquiry, an investigation going on. Now, remember, this shipwreck happened on June 14th. Their phones weren't requested by the court doing the inquiry until late September. Mm. How serious of an inquiry can it be when you don't, like, this is one of the most obvious pieces of evidence you could ask for, mm -hmm. right? They don't even bother to ask for that until late September. Um, you know, so any photo visual evidence mm -hmm. that should be there, that you'd expect to be there, you'd expect to be asked mm -hmm. for, weirdly isn't there, went missing, or nobody asked for it for a very long time. What about the footage from Italy, the drones? There's Frontex footage, which we've actually, many of us have seen. Mm -hmm. There's this, you know, sort of notoriously famous picture mm -hmm. of the Adriana, this blue uh, vessel. It was taken during the day on the 13th. That's by a Frontex uh, drone. Okay. So we've got that. But there is nothing from the moment they started towing the boat. Well, there might be, but those cameras were off, supposedly, yeah. or, you know, weren't requested by the court Even the Frontex us. one. Yeah, well, fr I don't think Frontex was there at the time uh, of the of the towing. It, it, uh, its drone had passed by previously mm -hmm. overhead. Mm -hmm. The thing to note about Frontex, they, they did an investigation that recently came out, actually. So mm -hmm. talking about investigations, there's a few, just to lay them out. There is the, um, uh, the Naval Court's investigation of what the Coast Guard was up to that day. This is where I just raised the concern that that court didn't even ask for the phones mm -hmm of the Coast Guard officials until late September, months later. Um, there is an inquiry uh, by the Greek ombudsperson, who sort of is the independent government official responsible for, for human rights. Um, there was a Frontex inquiry, mm -hmm. which has now come out. Yeah, they just released it, sent it to Solomon. But there are two, right? Because like Frontex has the internal one, but also the European ombudsman is investigating Frontex right. in this uh, capacity. And then there's something we haven't talked about at all, which is huge, which is who the Greek authorities are accusing mm -hmm. of being responsible for all of this, mm. which is nine Egyptian guys yeah. um, who are allegedly the, the ringleader smuggler criminals um, who are really responsible for all of these deaths. Now, the survivors we talked to said that that was not correct. They were not aware that, you know, some it, of their Egyptian, you know, uh, fellows on this, on this ship were, were responsible for that. We haven't been able to look into that in any detail, but um, there are real concerns that these, that these nine Egyptians could not, might not get a fair trial, and that they might, um, if convicted, 
well, that would change the tone of all the other inquiries into what the Coast Guard was responsible for. Because if there's a court that says, well, we know who the guilty guy is, and it's these nine Egyptians, well, then the responsibility of everybody else for the disaster would be mm-hmm. lower. Mm-hmm. So it would be very crucial, not just for the, the rights and lives of those Egyptians and their families, but also for justice for everybody else, that they get a fair trial. Mm-hmm. And you know what we've seen so far is a bit concerning. I, again, we haven't you know definitively concluded anything, but um, the people we talked to who survived, they said they didn't see any of these um, Egyptians running the show. You know, mm-hmm. the the smuggling ring. The, it's even worse than smuggling, really. I think some of this rises to the level of trafficking. Mm-hmm. There were people who told everybody comes from uh, different countries, but they wind up in Libya before they get on mm-hmm. the ship, right? Mm-hmm. And in Libya, conditions were horrible, as we all know, um, for just about all of them, including the children. Then when they're getting on the, on the Adriana, when they're being loaded onto the Adriana, some of them, um, two, two friends from Pakistan, um, t- early, er, guys in their early 20s, they knew each other way back from their village, came together all the way to Libya. They, see, they each pay $10,000 to get there. And then they see the state of the Adriana before it even takes off. And they're like, we don't want to get on this thing. This looks like a death trap. And they said they were whipped with leather belts to force them to get on that ship in Libya. So that's not even smuggling anymore. That's trafficking. And there was no indication that, you know, some random Egyptian guys were involved in that. That was Libyan, um, you know, uh, trafficking rings. So can we organize our knowledge about those trials? Because there are three trials happening, right? So we have the trial into those uh, Egyptian um, men. Uh, We have the naval court trial that is supposed to uh, determine uh, the um, Hellenic Coast Guard involvement. And we have the civil trial, right, of the uh, the survivors that are suing Hellenic Coast Guard, as uh, I um, understand well. There's 40 survivors who joined a lawsuit that, um, you know, was supported by the Greek Council for Refugees and others. Um, I think this was in November. And what they were basically doing is suing... um, for there to be a real investigation. You know, why the, 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 the focus of the complaint was sort of no evidence has been collected. Even, and by the way, even by late December, only 13 survivors had been called to present evidence. From the 40. From, from the 40, yeah. Or, but I mean, there were more survivors than that, right? They could have called others. But even out of those uh, 40, there were only 13 that we know of. Um, who were called to give evidence. So those, that trial is c- kind of a, an at- and a lawsuit attempt to force the Greek authorities to do what they should be doing anyway, which is like, you can't just ha- c- say we've opened an investigation and then make no progress and make no announcements for months and months and months, right? You have to do s- show that you're doing something. So that's my understanding of, of the, the, the gist of that. Mm-hmm. We're going to take a very short break, and we're going to come back in a moment with some uh, more information about those trials and the testimonies uh, uh, of the survivals from the Pillow Street Rock. A fundraising expert recently told us, your feed is too positive. You need to use images that show the suffering. You have to show the problem, but we won't show you pictures of crying children to pull at your heartstrings. We won't show you the homeless in Athens fresh off receiving asylum protection. We won't show you the exploitative working conditions our students must endure. What we will show you is a solution. Our solution. Our way of making a change. Our way of creating safety, stability, community. Our way of enabling a future we know is possible. Together we can create that future. Together we can change real lives, help them develop real skills, and ensure the real futures that they're fighting for. The media may show you takers, but we cultivate givers. Join us and change their future. And we're back after the break talking about the Pilos shipwreck. Uh, Bill, you presented for us all those trials that are happening right now. How, what is the connection between meaning and impact between one um, trial towards uh, the other one? Also, which of those trials, which, of th- which outcomes of those trials uh, may we know first? And how, how may this uh, end? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, you know, there's these inquiries and then there are these trials. The inquiries we talked about briefly, there's, you know, the Frontex stuff going on, there's the uh, European ombudsman, there's the Greek ombudsperson, but then there are these trials. There's the trial of the uh, nine Egyptians who've been accused of being the ringleaders and smugglers and captains and, you know, most responsible for all of this. There's the, um, there's the lawsuit by the 40 survivors who were, who were demanding that the other investigation by the naval court speed up and actually produce something, right? So the big, I think the, the, the two big ones that we're watching is the criminal trial of the uh, alleged smugglers, these nine Egyptians, and the inquiry by the naval court into what the Coast Guard was doing. So, you know, we don't know all the ins and outs of how these, how these trials are gonna relate um, to one another, but it stands to reason and a lot of people are concerned that if the nine Egyptians or if some of them are, um, are found to be guilty of this entire thing, they're the ones who are at fault. Well, then what is that going to do if the Naval Court inquiry into the Coast Guard's responsibility comes next? It will obviously, that inquiry will have to take into account that, well, we found the bad guy. You know, um, and they're they're going to be convicted and they're you know, and sentenced and everything. So that means that would mean that whatever the Coast Guard is responsible for is kind of lesser. Um, how are these inquiries talking to each other? I don't really know, but um, they can take a long time. You know, uh, I think pretrial detention is up to eighteen months in Greece. So you know, you can you can sort of delay um, the trial proceedings for quite a while in the case of the Egyptians. Um, yeah. Uh, what kind of evidence do they have against those specific nine individuals that they were the smugglers? I don't know all of the evidence they might have. We talked to some survivors who said that they were, they were spoken to and told to identify, um, you know, who was most responsible or did you see him, you know, and sort of point at. And some of this was very informal. This was even right when, pe when the survivors were, were disembarked. Um, and taken to Kalimata, uh, you know, some people told us, you know, they were, they were directed by Greek authorities. They didn't know who the authorities were, police or Coast Guard or what, just peop Greek people in uniforms were pointing at a mm -hmm. few um, of their fellow passengers and said, who's that, you know, or is, is that a smuggler? That was very anecdotal, um, the information we got from the survivors that, that spoke to us, but, you know, that could be some of the evidence. It would just be witness statements. But then we have concerns about the witness statements, given, again, that some of those initial witness statements seem to have been tampered with or were not correct, um, all using the same language, um, and the lack of other evidence. You know, Maybe somebody has a phone that actually had a picture of the people they say were really responsible on the Libyan side, who were actually not just maybe smugglers, but even potentially traffickers, mm -hmm. um, doing things against the will of these people who wound up on the boat. Um, but that evidence doesn't seem to have been looked at or taken into consideration yet that we know of. I, I read that these nine people, they were distributing food and water to people, and that's why they were accused, because they thought they are responsible for this ship. Some people something like that. People have different theories yeah. for why, why it was these guys, you know. And some of the other survivors said they were nervous to hand out food or yeah, to help yeah. people. There, there was a guy who was a, a trained... Um, uh, I forget if he was a medic, um, but he was one of the survivors, and, and he was trained in sort of how to save mm -hmm. people's lives, and he got really nervous that people would start pointing to him as like the doctor, yeah. because, you know, everybody was afraid that if the Greek authorities hear that you have some kind of a title or a name, even if it's mm -hmm. just totally yeah. informal, even if it's just because you were trying to help people, that you could then have the finger pointed at you as one of those supposedly responsible. Mm -hmm. uh, just you mentioned that the phones were given back to them, to the people after. Some. So, yeah. So were they any footage there? This the phones. I'm not sure what's on them mm -hmm. yet. Okay. Um, you know, it was like they said they found about 20 phones in a bag on their on the Coast Guard vessel. Mm. All right. Um, I'm I'm interested in the testimony. So you. Um, interviewed uh, 20 21 survivors, five relatives of uh, people who are still missing, and representatives of the Hellenic Coast Guard. So how did those testimonies differ? Th this is my um, 
uh, my question because I wonder like what can we actually get from those Hellenic Coast Guard testimonies? Are they of like any value or are they also like exactly the same, very, you know, formal? What we've seen of the so we're talking now about the testimonies that or the statements mm -hmm. that survivors gave to the Hellenic Coast Guard like immediately upon uh, being disembarked from mm -hmm. uh, after, after they were rescued. And as noted, concerns that these testimonies are don't look credible because they have exactly the same language um, despite being in different despite using different interpreters and because they don't mention anything about what caused what actually caused the, their ship to go mm -hmm. down. I don't know that these statements have anything of value in them other than to point out the concerns about the way these statements were taken. Mm -hmm. the, the value they have as evidence is evidence that they're worthless. Um, so far as we know, there may be other bits and pieces that you could cobble together searching through them, but I think a much easier way to find what really happened if the authorities were interested is to interview more people in non-coercive circumstances, right? It's, it's strange that the survivors who talked to us were they seemed both terrified to tell us what really happened and desperate to tell us what really happened. Some of them said, I want to tell you so bad all the details, but wait till I leave Greece of first, course. right? I'm gonna tell you, but I'm gonna tell you on the phone from Germany, as mm -hmm. soon as I get to Germany. Now, we actually met a bunch of these people more than once and developed a sense of um, uh, trust. And you know, we actually got in-person uh, statements and interviews from, from all of the 21 people we talked to who were survivors. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fear was immense. They were absolutely terrified that if they said the wrong thing, they could not only not get their asylum claim processed, maybe they would get in trouble with the authorities. You know? So there was a lot of coercion. This is just not the way you do a criminal interview, a, a criminal investigation. You know? If you have 600, more than 600 people are dead and we can't do a better job of, of in interviewing people than put them in coercive circumstances where they're clearly afraid to say what really happened to them, I mean, come on. What is happening to those people who survived? Where are they right now? Are they in camps? They are scattered. Um, they're all over the place. I'm not in touch with you know all of mm -hmm. them, but uh, just just a small handful. And they're in different places. Some are in the Netherlands. Some are in Germany. I think some went to the UK. Um, and people have completely different life experiences from now on. You know, some are in camps. Some are with family. Um, so were they? allowed to go to other uh, countries as they are so scattered or did they just go what what happened after the shipwreck was kind of interesting and i i don't know the, you know the, the facts of what happened in terms of the the decisions that were made but there were some interesting unusual things that happened normally if you are uh an asylum s if you're a migrant who comes to greece and you claim asylum because you've been persecuted you're you know could be killed if you get sent back home um it takes a long time it takes a long time, and your conditions are lousy. Um, you know, it is not easy to be an asylum seeker in Greece. Um, the uncertainty, the lack of documentation, uh, the, f the fears that your claim will be rejected, you know, all of that weighs very heavily on you. The survivors of the Adriana got document. They, their process was very rapid by comparison. You know, within a few, not a few, you know, a year or more than a year, within a few months or a month, these people were getting their documents that allowed them to legally leave Greece and go elsewhere. So, you know, that was pretty, yeah. pretty interesting. Um, the and other it thing- It must have been a political decision from somewhere to just have this done, ready. It's dozens of people, right? It wasn't just one case where, oh, by a fluke, somebody got their paperwork processed really quickly. Mm -hmm. No, it was, Everybody we know of um, had that happen to them. The other sort of a little unusual thing um, that happened was that uh, pushbacks, reports of pushbacks by the Greek Coast Guard stopped for a while. They really, really went down. We, we did not hear, and now it's not a permanent thing. Uh, there have been other pushbacks reported uh, recently, but in you know this, the space of time right after mm -hmm. that massive disaster, there seems to have been some decision that, you know, cool it. We're not going to do pushbacks for a while. Uh, there were mentions, uh, they mentioned in the Frontex internal report that the Coast Guard asked Frontex to send a drone to another incident located south of Crete when the situation there was under control. Frontex offered to send the drone to the location of the Adriana. The Coast Guard did not respond to the offer. So they told them, send it to Crete. 
And when they sent him there, there was nothing. Yeah. Why is Crete so involved in this story that was nowhere close to Crete? It's where the the Coast Guard vessel is sent from, even though it took them seven hours to get there, and it's where a Frontex drone is directed away from, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people on a cl- on a vessel that is clearly in distress with dead bodies already on board. No, we don't need your drone. Send mm-hmm. it. But we got something, you know, hundreds and hundreds of nautical miles away on the south of Crete that you need to take a close look at right now. I mean, Frontex's report said mm-hmm. that they offered four times to assist the Greek authorities, yeah. and they were rebuffed or ignored every time. Do they have these records of these phone calls or something? I mean, the Frontex report has been, I don't know if it's public, but it's sort of out. It's been leaked. Yeah, it's uh, Frontex internal report, yeah. I think Solomon got, that's why I'm reading it from, yeah, Solomon got it, yeah. yeah. But they didn't mention if these phone calls were recorded or... Well, I think they would be recorded, mm-hmm. would be my guess, yeah. That's huge evidence. Yeah, well, this is the 15 hours before the ship yeah. is sunk mm-hmm. where people could people's lives could have been saved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the sort of weird, uh, the other weird detail about Frontex, right, is like if you are the biggest agency mm. of the European Union with the biggest budget and you have all of these assets mm. all over the place and you see hundreds of people on a lousy sinking boat that might go down, your only obligation is to tell the Greek authorities or whoever's waters it's in about this impending disaster. Mm. But if those authorities, I mean, say it was Italy or somewhere else, if those authorities had said no, well, you don't, you can't, then that's it for you. You as Frontex don't have an obligation to do anything else. You're not really supposed to do anything else, according to Frontex. They're not, what, how is this a search and rescue agency? It doesn't seem to be one, right? It's, it's a search a and notify. It's a protection agency. Search, notify, protect the borders, you know, prevent migration, whatever. But at, in this incident, uh, what one of the things that this incident raises is this structural problem that mm-hmm. Frontex doesn't seem to have the authority or the willingness or ability to directly intervene when it sees people are about to die. It has to wait for a member state to mm-hmm. tell them that it's okay or to request their assistance. Mm-hmm. This is something that intrigues me, and I really don't know. Uh, I, I have no knowledge about how international law uh, states this issue. Frontex, Frontex has to be invited by a member state to be part of their operations, right? They cannot just go and, and be like, okay, now we're going to help you with your borders. Um, they are invited by the Greek or Italian uh, Coast Guard to be part of their operation or support them. If, if the Greek Coast Guard is not doing anything, Shouldn't Frontex be obliged to react just based on the law of sea maritime uh, law? Mm, the, the issue is like there is something above just this agreement. Okay, we're not reacting. You're not supposed to um, react because those are our waters. If you see a boat in distress and you have the ability of saving this boat, this this is what the law says, right? Like you you have to react. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right. The international law of the sea is very clear when it comes to the duty to rescue Mm -hmm. ships in distress, vessels in distress. Um, There's other sort of uh, treaties and international agreements. There's also the EU's own regulations Mm -hmm. that are more or less consistent with that international law. But then when it comes to Frontex and the bureaucratic intricacies of, you know, how it interacts with member states, that's when all of this sort of becomes strangely confusing and muddy and hard to understand. You know, it's actually very clear. Mm -hmm. Let's say that these nine accused are guilty. Can they appeal in the EUA court or or that's it? You can, yes, you could appeal. I mean, they would, it's a, it's a criminal trial. So they would have the, uh, they would have the possibility to appeal in Greece. Mm -hmm. And then if things go really terribly in Greece and they, you know, think that they have a case to take even further, then you can go up all the way to the European court. Let's say, the g- so it's obvious to me that the Greek authorities are doing their best to hide the truth, whatever the truth is. <coughs> what are the consequences if Greece is found guilty? Well, found guilty by whom would be Let's one question. EU court. Well, so we've got to, first of all, we'll see what happens with the naval court investigation mm. into what the Coast Guard did, they right? Don't trust that. And we'll, well, unfortunately, you may be right um, not to trust a naval court investigation into the Greek Coast Guard based on what happened with that Pharmakonisi case 
in 2014. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because that went to the Naval Court. The Naval Court basically exonerated, said the Greek Coast Guard was not responsible for doing terrible things. And that case was then appealed all the way up to the European Court, which in 2022 issued a very stern judgment that said Greece had completely failed to adequately investigate or hold people accountable mm -hmm. for the deaths of those people in 2014. So, you know, that was the Naval Court in action almost 10 years ago. One hopes that they have learned lessons and are going to pursue this case in the interests of justice rather than the interests of politics. My big issue with this shipwreck, there have been several tragedies, not many of, of this size, but just for a minute, Imagine this boat in distress with around 750 people on board. They're calling for help, they're showing dead bodies, they have no food, no water, people are panicking. And imagine for a second that they do not come from Syria or Pakistan or Egypt. Imagine that they are white and they are Germans, that they are Austrians or Brits. There would be a whole rescue operation happening regardless of their reason of being on this boat. And this is not only a matter of human trafficking here or, um, or the refugee crisis. It is also a matter of race here. And when I think about this, I don't know if you remember a um, few months ago last year, there was this big issue on the news of this like titanic vessel that went submarine that went to like, rediscover um, a titanic and several billionaires on board of this mm -hmm. it went missing it was uh, it was very small five people there were tremendous resources put in place to find them several people Wha one of them was pakistani but a billionaire and Nobody questioned that. Nobody questioned that. We have 600 people dying on this boat. And it's not even in the news anymore. Nobody's asking what is happening with those inquiries, those trials, nothing. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's no secret that the borders are racialized, obviously. Um, and that, that example of, the, was it the Titan submersible? Was that what it was called, that little submarine with all the multimillionaires and billionaires on board? I really don't remember the name. It happened around the same time. It got all this media attention. It got all of these naval assets dispatched to do certain, you know, in a very deep area of the sea. Um, yeah, I mean, and there's been, no one was ever even under the illusion. No one was even ever under the hope that there would be a rescue operation that that would go down and recover the bodies of the Adriana. It's too deep there. It's a very deep part of the Mediterranean. Yes, that's true. But I mean, there wasn't even an attempt to like hire a submersible with a camera, like a drone submarine that could go down without people on it, take some pictures, you know, nothing from, from the authorities. As if those more than 600 bodies just didn't really matter. They can stay where they belong. And you know, what do we, where does that come from? that lack of interest in uh, people who are not white, um, who, who were basically forced into a deadly situation in an attempt to get to Europe. You know, it's not just an innocent, mm -hmm. I think, uh, question. It's, uh, it's part of a policy of letting death at sea uh, be part of Europe's official um, way of dealing with migration. Mm -hmm. Let's hope that enough of these people die or suffer basically crimes against humanity is what the UN found is going on in Libya. So, you know, if you want to come to Europe in pursuit of a better life, which ironically needs labor power, you know, many European countries' populations are shrinking and aging and actually need more immigration, uh, you know, people who can do the, do the work to keep those economies afloat. Yet if somebody tries to get there to make a decent life for their family, or not to make a decent life, but because they have to flee where they are because they could be killed, or persecuted, you know, the only way they're supposed to get there is doing crazy stuff like going to detention camps in Libya where you are stuck, given very little water for weeks before you even get on the overcrowded, unseaworthy vessel that may or may not deliver you to the bottom of the sea or to a better life in Europe. 
I mean, it's not an accident that the deaths of people like that who are black and brown, you know, didn't gather the resources to save them before it happened or to investigate what happened after it, after it happened. It is obvious that Greece doesn't wish to have more refugees um, in their country. And it seems like the Pillow's shipwreck works nicely as a deterrence uh, factor. Like people seeing that something like this is happening, that there, is b there are basically no consequences for the ones who caused this tragedy. It seems like the Greek authorities may think that this may scare away people from like coming to this country, or if they already got to this country, they will very fast move to the next one. So it, it, it seems like there's, it's not only a matter of, n of the fact that there are no consequences. Nobody seems to treat it seriously at all. Like they, do, they, don't, they, they do not even fear that there will be some kind of a European Union investigation or something like this, because there has never been like a true consequences to any of the horrible things they are doing to refugees in this country. Period. It's done. Like, okay, happened. You, s you saw what happened when you were coming. This is what happens at sea. This is what awaits you once you are here. Those horrible camps. I'm uh, getting very agitated when I speak about this um, subject. But I wanted to say one thing. Because we are trying to be objective in this podcast as much as we can. But neutrality is not an option here. So a veteran journalist, Christiana Manufour, she once said, don't be neutral, be truthful. And this is what we were trying to do here um, with you today, to get more information about Pillow's shipwreck and also to spread this information farther uh, so that more people know about this tragedy. In 2016, I got in a boat from Izmir to come here, to come to Mytilene. And I remember after 20 minutes, the boat stopped, the engine stopped. And then we saw a Turkish coast guard passing by us. We were like, help, help. And they didn't even look at us. And I was like, oh my God, they didn't help us. Now I'm like, maybe that was for the best. What if, yeah, what if, if they tried to tow us and we, we died? Now I really, when I saw what happened to the Adriana, I was like, oh my God, maybe we were lucky that you cannot, uh, you can trust the authority. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Very negative end of the podcast. No, no, I have another uh, question <laughs> <Okay>. at the <laughs> end. <laughs> uh, so, Bill, what what's your response to people who say these immigrants, these refugees are to blame because they are choosing these dangerous methods to come to Europe? And to be honest, I feel when I got into that boat, I said to myself, this is suicide. And I still struggle with this. I still blame myself. I see myself as to blame for this because I chose this method. So You remind me of something that the, um, I mentioned these two young men from Pakistan who were friends uh, before who, who amazingly both survived. And one of them said, um, I think this was several months after the shipwreck when, when we, we talked to him a couple times. And the second time he said, you know, I still, every time we close our eyes, every time at night we close our eyes, we have nightmares. Um, we always see our friends that we made on the journey drowning. Um, you know, their survivor's guilt yeah. is very real. The, the, depending on where survivors wind up, they may or may not have any access to mental health support, which you obviously is crucial yeah. for, for any case like this. Um, but maybe they get it, maybe they don't. Who's checking? You know, does it really matter? Do we really care? It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty awful. But to your, to your point, I mean, um, people told us that too. Survivors told us that too. Uh, when they made it, when they got to Libya, it seems like that's when the story they had been told by whoever their contacts were, the middlemen, the smugglers, that's when the stories diverged from reality. There's not going to be a plane that takes you legally to Europe, um, if you ever thought there was. There's not even going to be a seaworthy vessel the nice stories you were told about how there will be food on board. You don't have to bring water. Leave yeah. your water behind on the shore. There will be everything you want on the boat. You know, it, it, it turned just into a nightmare very quickly. But um, it's not just those people who know or don't know the reality of what they're getting into, right? There's also the European politicians, 
and officials who know exactly what's happening in Libya because Europe has been funding the Libyan, the so-called Libyan Coast Guard, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, as we all know, it's basically a, a factory. You, you just take the human product um, and extort them at various stages of their journey. So in a situation like that, I think it is the height of hypocrisy for any European official to blame or anybody to blame these these people for trying to get a better life for themselves with, because there's no other option for many of them except to take illegal routes and the horrors they suffer along those illegal routes have been supported by the European Union. You know, that money is going from Brussels to Italy to the Libyan Coast Guard and it's, you know, we've called for that to stop. Thank you. Bill, thank you very much for being with us today and helping us explain uh, the issues of um, Pillow's shipwreck. We will be back in two weeks' time with another topic, but just to remind everybody, you can suggest another topic related to human movement, to the so-called refugee crisis. You can comment on this podcast and suggest this uh, topic, or you can write us an email. is always in uh, the notes. You can also support this podcast, which we very much encourage you to do. Also, information's in uh, the notes. I would very much like to thank also Rashid, my co-host. Yeah. Yeah. Our production team is Suda Fazlolach, Eli Fazlolach, Davud Nuri. The mentor is Rashid Ghali. Oh, I'm sorry. The mentor is Douglas Herman. <laughs> He's a fan. <laughs> oh, hard day for <laughs> him today. Um, we very much thank you for joining us and we'll be back in two weeks. Can you tell me about your experience in uh, Western Sahara? What did you do? Um, we were, we hadn't done any reporting on Western Sahara for like 10 years. So it was kind of an overview trip, just what's going on. And you know, it was the usual thing where you hear some crazy, stupid stuff, but the government keeps saying it so you have to look into it. So part, of, I'm just mentioning this because part of what we did was sort of debunk the, the, the arguments by the Moroccan authorities that uh, Sahrawi culture is full of slavery and that the camps in Tindouf, they've got you know, slaves all over the place and it's just terrible. You know, so we looked into that. And yeah, there's a very, very yeah. complicated uh, history there. Um, but in terms of like forcing people to do manual labor and it being widespread, you know, we didn't we didn't find that. Um, you know, we found evidence that was concerning, but nothing like the claims that the Moroccan government was making.